Um, but thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry we have uh, a little bit of de technical difficulty at the beginning, uh, but I do definitely appreciate you having me, uh, Richard. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about my new book, Called Up, which is uh, Ball Players Remember uh, Becoming Major Leagues. Again, my name is Zach Ford. You go ahead and go to the next slide here. So a little bit about me. Um, um, I am the chair of the Dusty Baker Sacramento Sabre chapter. I've um, been doing that for about four years. Um, including about a year for uh, being co-chair. Uh, I was involved with the chapter almost since, since its inception, um, about a year after it uh, was formed, uh, when I was actually in high school. Um, so that was, was uh, about 26, 27 years ago that uh, um, I first got involved in the chapter. I've always had a, a huge interest in the old Pacific Coast League, um, the old league that was out here on the West Coast uh, prior to the arrival of the Giants. I am a Giants fan. Uh, my favorite baseball book is The Glory of Their Times. I always thought that Lawrence Ritter uh, was able to capture the first person narratives in a way that um, showed um, emotion. It showed them um, as human beings, as opposed to just baseball players, the behind the scenes stories was something that always kind of captivated me as a young baseball fan. Um, and I was more of a baseball fan than a player. I was terrible. I was probably about a 200 hitter throughout my little league years. Um, but despite that, I still had the dream uh, that I would become a major league baseball player. And I think that a lot of players, a lot of folks, a lot of us uh, regardless of how well we did in Little League, we still had that dream. And I I, I said that at the at the very beginning of my my introduction is, you know, when I was when I was a kid, you know, ball players weren't human to me. They were kind of superheroes. Um, and I felt as though, um, you know, even though a lot of boys maybe dream about, you know, being Superman flying through Metropolis, I was pretending to be Will Clark hitting home runs in at Candlestick Park. Uh, that's actually me as Kent, as uh, Will Clark in 1989 for Halloween. And then my my great uncle, uh, Larry Powell, was a phantom ba major leaguer uh, in 1946 with both the uh, Red Sox and the Braves. And uh, his story, uh, kind of in baseball purgatory, as I guess you could say, is one of the inspirations uh, for this book. I guess you could say those last three things are really where I was kind of inspired to put this together. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and do next slide. All right, so about the book, uh, and this is about the book kind of structure itself. It is a collection of 109 first person player stories, uh, all based on original interviews, um, like uh, Ritter did. He took the interviews and I, I pieced them together into more of a first person narrative form. Um, so it's kind of like it reads like spoken word. And what I did was I kind of I, I focused on trying to capture the feelings and emotions of becoming a major league baseball player. So the, the stories will be loaded with behind the scenes uh, details of how they got the news, how they reacted, who were some of their first calls, you know, how they felt when they first walked in that big league clubhouse, uh, when that bullpen phone rang, you know, what was going through them. Um, um, as 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 a person, as a you know, with the human interest stories, debuts range from 1961 to 19 uh, or to 2018. Uh, first player in there is actually Sam McDowell. Came up as a young 18 year old, 1961, uh, with the Indians. The last player in there is actually an active Major League Baseball player, Patrick Wisdom from the Chicago Cubs. Um, and Major League service time ranges from two days. Uh, to over two decades. Uh, there's a player in there. There's only one player in there that's a phantom player. There was a player in there uh, that got called up for the by the Padres. And uh, due to an unusual uh, double play when he was warming up, he did not get into the game. Um, he was going to go in. There was an unusual double play. Um, and uh, the inning moved on. The game moved on. And he ended up getting sent down the next year, the next day and never got back. Uh, to the big leagues so there that's the two-day guy and then we have uh jerry royce uh who is the one with the major the largest uh, service time i did arrange uh debuts or uh, stories in the debut order uh into those four different sections and nearly all teams uh are represented um i think i had all teams represented when i was first doing the interviews um obviously mcfarland was uh wanting me to go through back through and do some waivers this is my first book so i 
admittedly did not think of that at first. Uh, but when I went back through, I think there were the Astros and the Diamondbacks were the two teams that were not represented. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to the time frame sections, and I'll kind of give you a little bit of an overview about, um, you know, what was impacting call ups, what was impacting call uh, um, roster moves during those particular time frames. Obviously, in the 60s and 70s, you had huge expansion uh, from 16 to 26 teams. A lot of minor leagues disbanded. You had an amateur draft. Um, and then also uh, it was impacted briefly by moving around free agency. 17 players from that time frame are included, 17 stories. 1980s, um, there's some stories impacted by the 1981 strike. Um, obviously, it started in probably the 70s and grew into the 80s and um, is also obviously really specialized and prominent now. But the role of the relief pitcher changed a lot of roster moves, too. Um, and impacted call-ups. Uh, rosters, sizes did change in the 80s too, and there are 15 players from that decade. I'll go ahead and move on to the next one. All right, so the 90s, we had another uh, decade of expansion, more labor uh, strife. We had a few stories uh, impacted by each one of those, where obviously 1994 call-ups did not happen because there was no uh, 1994 call-ups uh, at the end of September because there was no baseball season. Um, there has also been obviously a lot of changes to disabled list, now the injured list over the last uh, 30 years or so, which has impacted and increased the size or uh, the number of roster moves. Huge changes, restructuring in minor league baseball, uh, and even more changes uh, to the uh, injured list just within the last couple of years. And and the middle uh, little image there is as baseball has been expanding over the last 60 years, obviously a lot of the uh, there's been a larger pool of international talent, too. So while we have expanded as a um, while there's been more teams, the pool size has also grown uh, exponentially as, as as well, too. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. We'll talk about uh, stories and I'll give you a couple of examples. So um, I told you a little bit about the structure of the book. This is about kind of the structure of the stories. Uh, again, this is a collection of first person human interest stories. Uh, the goal was to capture what can't be obtained uh, from looking at a box score. And that's the feelings and emotions of becoming a major league baseball player. So the first question I asked players uh, was, when did you first realize that you had the talent to become a major league baseball player? Now, my my purpose for this question was not necessarily that for them to say, you know, when I was 17 years old or when I was in double A or whatnot. I wasn't trying to get a particular age or time frame. When I asked this question, I knew that it would spark memories of different moments uh, throughout their early baseball time of different mentors of, you know, of uh, different moments different coaches, different, uh, you know, family members taking him to games. Um, when things kind of clicked on the field, it would give them um, a spark um, that would often, um, some of the stuff that they would reference as far as the mentors, when I asked that question, would resurface uh, later on in the stories when they're talking about possibly people that visited them at their major league debut or, or who had, uh, been people that they wanted to thank along their journey. Um, the first person player, uh, the narratives have been edited only minimally uh, from the interview transcripts. Obviously, I kind of cut and pasted, moved interviews, uh, transcripts around to where they flowed um, sto in story form, but it will read like spoken word. So there are uh, going to be some times where, you know, there may be a little grammar inflections that uh, are, aren't correct. Maybe player flips between past and present tense, but it, want, it will read like spoken word. And I did obviously clean things up to where it will read uh, smoothly, but I did uh, want to give readers the feeling that the ball players were telling them the stories as they are reading the stories. So I, I want to be sensitive of time, but I do want to at least share uh, one story, um, and that's Jason Bergman uh, with the 2005 Nationals. Um, and um, so he was an 11th round pick uh, when they were still in uh, Montreal at the Montreal Expos in 2002. Um, and he had a kind of a common theme 
of um, his his uh, baseball journey being impacted by hurricanes. Uh, the end of the 2004 season, he was playing in the Florida State League, and they actually had the playoffs. The very end of the season cut short uh, due to a hur uh, hurricane. I think it was Hurricane E. Ivan going through that particular year. Um, but they cut the in very end of the Florida State League season short, and he ended up going over to Double A as a result. The very the very end of that particular season. So obviously, fast forward 2005, um, and he starts off at Harrisburg, and then he ends up, you know, playing the majority of the year in New Orleans. We obviously know what happened in 2005. Uh, he was called up during Hurricane Katrina. During Hurricane Katrina, um, so he gets the call. Um, I believe it's August 27th or August 28th. Um, and at that particular time, the hurricanes, the hurricanes near, you know, about to land in, New, you know, New Orleans. And he's packing up his apartment with his girlfriend, trying to, you know, getting ready for the end of the season. Not sure what's going on during all of this. He's literally packing up his apartment, trying to make things safe. He gets a call. Um, he's not sure where to go because the the season's kind of up in arms, right? They they're not sure where they're going to go next. He gets a call saying, "Hey, look, um, it's about maybe I think he said it's about one forty five in the afternoon or something like that. Hey, you got to get to the airport at two thirty. Uh, you know, you're going to get called up to the big leagues." And he's like, "Oh man, he's like the field's like 10, 15 minutes away, and then the airport's another you know fifteen twenty minutes on that." So he he and his girlfriend at the time hop into the car, go to the stadium, load everything up. By that time, things are just crazy on the roads. He's not able to get to, on a perfect scenario. The airport's 15, 20 minutes away. In 10 or 15 minutes, he moves about five car lengths. Right. So he calls up the, the nationals and he's like, man, he's like, there's no way I can. There's no human possible it's impossible for me to catch this flight um and the guy from the national says hey look okay um hang tight i'll get back to you as soon as possible and he's sitting there in the car with his girlfriend stuck in traffic and he's like what's going on you know what can i do um eventually not long after they call and say hey get up to baton rouge he has three hours to get in Bat Baton Rouge. I think it takes him two and a half. He barely makes it. So he gets to Baton Rouge, goes to Atlanta, then makes it up to uh, Washington that particular evening. Um, gets to Washington maybe about midnight, something like that. Checks in the hotel. That next morning, obviously, it's his first game, first day in the big leagues. Can't think about anything. He goes to the stadium super early that morning. And uh, he's the only one there. He's hanging out in the locker room just with his thoughts. And obviously everything is focused on Katrina. He's 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 in there in his major league uniform. He's in there in that major league clubhouse. But he's watching the TV. Everything on there is Katrina. And he's having to, you know, He's fulfilling this dream, but yet at the same time, he's like, hey, I got family down there. My apartment's, you know, about to get hit. All this stress, right? Um, so the next day, you know, that uh, later that day, you know, players start coming in and he's talking to relief pitchers and the relief pitchers are like, hey, my arm is shot. You have a high possibility of getting in today. Well, sure enough, he gets in that first game. Um, and... <laughs> Mike Stanton, who was somebody who followed Mike Stanton, who was a, uh, you know, a pretty uh, prominent relief pitcher with the Yankees during their heyday in the in the 90s, um, is on the Nationals that particular time. It's somebody that Jason had looked up to. So Jason and Mike are out in the bullpen. Mike gets in the game, loads up the bases. Right. And um Jason gets called in to relieve Mike Stanton, who's one of the guys who looked up to following the Yankees. Um, bases are loaded when when my, when uh, Jason gets in and he gives up he gives up a hit, um, allows a couple runs to score. Um, eventually gets out of the inning, um, goes back to the dugout, 
the relief pitchers are so beat up, they don't do a double switch. They say, hey, you go out there and hit in the bottom of the eighth. <laughs> he's like, holy moly, you know, I'm a pitcher. I haven't hit in so long. So he goes out there and he's like, oh, my gosh, right? So he has no bat. He has no batting gloves. He's a pitcher. Getting, he just got called up. What are the likelihood that a relief pitcher is going to get into the game as a hitter, right? So he goes so out. And he gets uh, he and he just swings. He says he's he says he didn't even think about. It. He just swung at and he somehow connected with the ball and had an unassisted ground out to first base. He circles first base as a batter, has to go in the dugout and gets his glove and goes back out there and strikes out the side in the top of the ninth. Um, so a pretty exciting multi layered story. I want to share at least a little bit of his words. Um, so, you know, he's, he says he's sitting there, um, I'll, I'll read a little bit of his story there. Um, and don't worry about, uh, scrolling through there. I'll bring it up separately on mine. Um, but, uh, let me double check here. Okay. So I'll read my notes here and it will show his, um, okay. So he's saying, I'm sitting there, and this is going back to where he's uh, um, in the car, trying to deal with the situation of, okay, what's going on? Am I going to be able to get to this, get to the airport? I'm stuck in this Hurricane Katrina traffic. I'm sitting there in the car, looking at my girlfriend, and I'm like, what if this hurricane screws up my chances of going to the major leagues? I'm in New Orleans. I can't get to the airport, and they need a guy for tomorrow. They could just call up a guy from Harrisburg and he'd drive down in no time. That was running through my mind. Obviously, the hurricane was a huge issue because our stuff was there, her family was there, and everything else. I get a call back and he says, get to Baton Rouge. We've got a flight for you at 530. Well, I have three hours to get in Baton Rouge and it takes two and a half hours to get there. I barely made the flight. Then we had a decision to make. My girlfriend was driving me to the airport, but she couldn't get back to be with her family because they had closed off all access to the roads due to the hurricane. I'm sitting there at the gate and I'm like, well, how much does it cost for her to fly with me? Keep in mind, minor league players don't make that much for last minute flights, right? He says, they name their price. And I decided at that point, not only in my baseball life, but my future morning or future marriage, come with me, let's do this. We both flew to Atlanta. I had a connection in DC and she stayed. The team was only gonna be in DC for one day and then head to Atlanta. I said, I'll meet you in 24 hours. It was the most amazing and worst day ever. We lost all of our <laughs> stuff before because of the flooding, but I got to realize my dream of going to the big leagues. So that's one example. Um, and I wanted to share with you, if you have any questions or, or comments or whatnot, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, but I do definitely understand and appreciate that, uh, we've got a, a little bit of a, a late start. So I want to be respectful of your time. No, we appreciate, uh, we, it was our fault for starting late. So, uh, anybody got a question, anything? No, great yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. Question here. Uh, without disclosing too much, did you get to interview your idol will the thrill i did not get to interview will the thrill um will was uh one of my favorite players for a couple of years um and um you know i most of them were not um high profile players per se i do have some i do have some folks who are multiple all-stars on there but for the most part um, they were players that were lesser known, um, lesser known players. Um, but I did get to interview a lot of the players on the Giants that um, were my heroes uh, from the late 80s. Uh, in fact, at one time, um, and I told him this, which I was slightly embarrassed to tell him this, but it was kind of, it, I, I felt as though I had to. Um, there was a utility player for the Giants in the late 80s, early 90s by the name of Greg Litton. Um, and, uh, as a kid, Greg, Greg Litton was, 
a, a player that would always autograph for my brother and I and the other kids around. He talked to us uh, at yeah. the field. And um, I actually had, he was actually kind of one of my favorite baseball players at the time. In fact, in 1990, I have a little league card on the back. It says uh, favorite player, Greg Litton. Uh, and I was able to talk to Greg Litton. I told him that story and I told him, I said, you know, I hope you're not offended by this. And I know that Little League is infinitely higher level than, or uh, Major Leagues is infinitely higher level than uh, Little League. But when I was a kid, I kind of thought of myself as Greg Litton as as a Little League player, because I was kind of like the little the the utility player back and forth. So he kind of got a kick out of that. But that was a huge that was a huge interview for me. And I know it's probably somebody nobody has ever heard of. Uh, but as a young baseball nerd, to hear his uh, story um, as somebody who was one of my favorites as a player, that was that was really special. I think I think Greg Litton was born in New Orleans. He didn't he didn't live here very long. But I, that, yeah, I think know? he is actually out of the Louisiana yeah. area. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was language an issue? Um, you know, pe uh, people did speak English as a second as their first language. There, yeah, there were there were a, a, a few challenges. Um, I did reach out to um, basically my approach was kind of like a shotgun approach on, you know, I basically reached out to anybody who had any kind of major league service time who was willing to chat with me. Um, so I reached out to, you know, people on social media, reached out to, I did Google searches a lot um, for a lot of folks. Um, there were um, some, some, some of the Latin American players that I was able to talk to. I think naturally, um, some of them, if they do have a little bit of a language barrier, they're probably less likely to follow up with uh, a first time green writer like myself, as opposed to whether or not somebody like, you know, MLB Network was to make the connection. Right. Um, but I did talk to some, you know, players that came out of Latin America um, and they were able to talk about some of the different like, for example, Jose Ortiz, uh, Jose Ortiz, who's somebody who. Uh, um was an inaugural Sacramento River cat. So it was kind of special to me too, because I came out of the Sacramento area. He was uh, came out of the Dominican Republic, uh, had a lot of tri trials and tribulations with uh, injuries. 19 uh, or uh, 2000, had a breakout season uh, with the inaugural River Cats, the Coast League, and he gets called up and, um, and uh, plays his first game against um, the Rays. And he, he, he kind of joked, he said he, he ran into Vinny Castilla a few uh, a few years later playing in Mexico or they were they were in Mexico at a game and and uh he said you know Vinny you had you you you, you ruined my major league during like you he's like he he said that so Jose Ortiz was a little guy and he he throws he he hits a swinging bunt or uh, down the the third base side and 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 Vinny Castilla gets them out on a great play and and he said, "Hey, you know, it always been my dream to have a uh, have a hit, my first major league at bat, and it just didn't happen because of you. Thanks for ruining my career." And it's obvious, just kind of joking. It's two Latin American players, you know, chatting and uh, chatting about uh, baseball and their first experiences uh, in the Mexican leagues a few years after. But um, uh, there are a few Latin American players, but for the most part. Um, I, I do think that um, the language barrier, to be candid, probably prevented them from probably following back up with me anyways. But there were a few that were a little bit more comfortable with their English that were that that were able to chat with me. Very good. Any other questions? Sorry. Thanks for joining, Zach. Appreciate it. And uh, where, where can we find your book? Yeah, we can find it. Uh, it's currently available through McFarland. McFarland is doing du uh, direct orders now. Um, Amazon should be following shortly, even though Amazon has, I don't know, based on whatever weird algorithms they use for their book releases. Uh, don't pay attention to the, book, the Amazon book release times. But uh, what I would recommend uh, is if you go to calledupproject.com, that will have some different uh, ordering options. Um, you also obviously just look it up on a Google search. There'll be a lot of things that pop up right now, uh, but you can get it directly from McFarland uh, today. Very good. Congratulations on your book and uh, good luck with it. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I really yeah. appreciate it. And uh, okay. if you, anybody had any questions or whatnot, sh definitely don't be shy to shoot me an email or whatnot uh, anytime. And I also got a social media presence on there too. You can connect with me that way. Great. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you very much, Richard. You have a great day. Okay. All righty. Bye bye. Let's see. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see. Derb, you want to go next with your uh, article sure. on uh, baseball cards? Sure. Let's see. I, I had a, um, I've got a, I put it on here. Let me see if I can pull it up. For the folks. We're going to, we're going to send out all the presentations after the meeting. So if you, uh, Follow the attendees, so, um, you'll be able to see that. Well, we were talking a little bit earlier about baseball cards, mm -hmm. and uh, I think every every kid had a collection of baseball cards until he went to college, and then his mother threw away their collection mm -hmm. of baseball cards, and such as that. But and, and my mother did the same. But I was lucky enough to have saved my grandfather's baseball cards and he was a cigar smoker and believe it or not the the first tobacco cards that they used as as um, a piece of support for the packaging were for cigars before they were for cigarettes um, but in New Orleans we had a tremendous tobacco industry at one point in time we had dozens and dozens of cigarette factories and cigar factories uh, the first one mentioned is is simon hernsheim whose bequest as a matter of fact his when he died his bequest uh, funded the new orleans public library um william r irby company uh, he was a major benefactor for tulane university and then you had a couple of the others, but one of the things that you don't, you don't see these cards very much. Um, the coupon cigarette issue that is, is shown on the second page. Um, you don't see many of these cards. They're actually scarcer than, than the Honus Wagner card. Now it's not more expensive than the Honus Wagner card, um, but there are, are often more of those available than they are of any of the, the major leaguers that came in any of the three coupon series. And they did those between 1910 and 1919. The problem with it was that, of course, it was mostly local. So anyone who collected it lived in New Orleans. And as you just heard, we are subject to um, periodic bouts of hurricanes <laughs> and along with that you get heat and humidity and cockroaches and things that are generally not very favorable to the preservation of paper so most people's collections disintegrated in their attic or their grandparents attic and most people when they when they got it from their grandparents or whatnot they looked at it and said do you like baseball cards do you like baseball? no and they chucked them people would throw them away so they're very difficult to come by. They sell for um, about five, six hundred bucks a pop when you can find them. Um, and they're generally not in very good condition. But the artwork is very similar to the old Philadelphia caramel card series. Now, the artistry in all of these things in the, in the they were very incestuous. They used the same portrait and just changed. If they had to change um, a logo or they had to change a team color, it would be the same portrait in a different color so that they didn't have to you know, redo anything. Um, but there, it's an interesting set of um, cards from a period in New Orleans when we had a huge tobacco industry. We no longer have that. At one point, um, Dutch Morial's grandfather used to roll cigars <laughs> in New Orleans, and, and he used to talk about that. But um, we no longer have that tobacco industry here, but, which is a good thing uh, for those of us who, who used to smoke and don't smoke anymore. Okay. Um, but then, and, and the last one I added uh, is not a real; it's a tobacco card. It was. Um, from one of the baking companies over on Britannia uh, was the Wild Baking Company, and they engaged in a 
a, a couple of years of issuing out cards for uh, for their favorite players and whatnot else. And from time to time, those crop up, um, and, and they're equally rare. So it's just a just a different twist on um, most of the players that I've, I've collected. A couple of these cards, most of them never heard of. They were the 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 also ran, if you will, uh, in terms of players. They you know they, they were never um, you never saw Dave Ruth in in New Orleans tobacco card or any of that. But um, they're interesting nonetheless for their scarcity. So, so these weren't just New Orleans area players. No, they no. were they were major league yeah. players, and they and, and I gave you I gave you the series how many 60, 70 cards in a series. So they would pick a couple of players from each team, and, right. and do that. I had a feeling it had more to do with where they could get the artwork. Um, there was no such thing as having to get player permission, right. sign a contract to represent it. You could get whatever you, you could get the artwork you could produce from that standpoint. Uh, and of course, the players never participated in, in any of them. These were just premiums to give away with with uh, cigarettes or cigars. Uh, I learned more about what a Havana cigarette was, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and as it turned out, we had about six different uh Havana cigarette factories. Right, right. Uh, and they were all up and down in the quarter. And I've, I've done some research on some of those old buildings and whatnot that, that did that. But uh, it's it struck me as odd that you know we, we'd never heard of it before. And you don't see any of right. them. But um, if anyone wants to see one, I've got a few <laughs> that I've collected over the years. So oh, like the uh well, the five cent thing and then yeah, the note the World War World War One. Yeah. Yeah, kind of shoots it up. Yeah. Yeah. Makes me want to go find some local tobacco. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, next, I think we had uh, Justin. You want to uh, talk about your? Yeah. I, I, put it I, up on screen. Yeah, right. I passed. I'll make a copy. Oh, all right. Yeah, I just took these out this morning. So let me get that. Let me get the screen. So. But uh, yeah, I made this a few months ago, so um, kind of a change <laughs> in thought process here. But um, so basically, pulled some data off the internet. Um, I did this in early August, August 11th. I think I tracked it back to this morning based on the winds. So, kind of, you know, the money ball concept um, and no salary cap in Major League Baseball. So, teams like the Mets on the far right spent 340, over $340 million for, for not many wins. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then at the bottom left, you have Oakland, who's tanking. Oakland A's and Kansas City Royals, who were really good a few years ago, and then they've kind of gotten back at the low budget um, concept. And Justin, then, two things. Thank you for putting your name down. Even with my calibrated monitor, I couldn't have figured out the 30 different Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. On the original. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it looks better on. Machine. But explain to us how you calculated wins, because we've got teams on here that had more than seventy-five wins. So, well, I did it on August, August eleventh. Okay, so okay, so, right. so the, the first, the I can gotcha. I can update the data. I touched up this morning with the team names. Okay, so if there's interest, I can update the data and resend the fresh one. The wins will be easy, and then the payroll. I think we can accept it's going to be general. Right, same. right, yeah, yeah. So okay, good. So now I here. now I got you. Well, mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they don't look too bad on this one. Yeah. Uh, right there, 120. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the Rangers are a little further. But yeah, two teams in the World Series, one has half the payroll of the other. Uh, interestingly enough, I was checking it this morning, the Diamondbacks won 12 out of the next 15 games right. after I made this, and the Rangers lost 
Then out the next right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and then that, the Rangers, that little circle right there has I mean, the Dodgers, the Astros, and the Phillies. Perennial tunnel health is lately. And you got the Braves up there too. You know, they haven't had that pro season success yet. I was going to say, uh, I was telling Derby this morning, the Yankees have spent spent $82 million this year for players who did not play. That's right, yeah. right. Well, it, uh, I mean, either part of the season or full season or whatever. So. Well, it might be. It probably is, yeah. 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 yeah, it's been impressive. You said right back. Yeah. So. so. Bobby Bonilla. Yeah. 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 Still getting paid. <laughs> So the Orioles and, and the Rays would be the most uh, cost efficient then, right? Right. Exactly. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Been an Orioles fan, and then, yeah, the Rays. It's frustrating to their their stadium and their fans. <laughs> like, yeah. so I don't even want to watch the games on TV. I know, right. <laughs> so the, the Rays are supposed to get a new stadium in a few years, um, which might help attendance. The Diamondbacks' attendance will probably shoot up next year after this run. Right. right. Then, you know, yeah. they'll have more money. Well, I'm reasonably sure it should be against the law to have a dome stadium. Yeah, right. right. Well, um, a, a non-retractable. Yeah. Yeah. Dome stadium. Yeah. I, I mean, mean uh, Tropicana Field is just well, difficult to get to. That's why I hear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, right. it was an urban renewal project, and it right. worked because right. it was in an old neighborhood, and they they put it there, and it did. It revitalized the neighborhood and everything else. A horrible place to watch right. the ball game. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, it's bad. Worse than the Superdome. <laughs> uh, probably so. Yeah, yeah. The field, the field is great. The Superdome field was horrible, yeah. if you recall. The lighting, the lighting was look, but Tropicana is just a. But it's hard to get there, like you said. I have a friend who lives down there. Yeah, it's like people were just not going to drive at five thirty on a Wednesday. Well, you have that one causeway that you have to go through. Yeah. We went. So it's like going to work. We had a godson uh, uh, played for Tulane uh -huh. uh, in 2001, 2002, whatnot. So we went, uh, we traveled with them, whatnot. When they played South Florida, we went a couple of days early because the Yankees were in town. And we got tickets. And I told my wife, I said, don't be surprised when there are more Yankee fans than Rays fans. Right, right, they, exactly. yeah. they have their spring training facility yeah. there. <laughs> And I had a two lane sweatshirt right. on because it was inside. And home run came, and we stood up and high five people. And the kid behind us said, "Y'all here from Tulane?" And I said, "Yes." Said, well, you double our fan base. <laughs> it was a South Florida team was sitting right. Behind <laughs> you know, and, and it was it was maybe nine thousand people at a major league. Yeah, in the stadium. Yankees are in <laughs> 9,000 people because, so I hope if they put it where that S curve is, are yeah, you familiar with it? it? It interstate comes through and it makes a big S and then it goes south. And that S curve is the middle of town. That's where right. they've been That's talking like about putting that okay. facility. Yeah, I hope sense. they get it. Because that would be, because oh, then the, the modern line. design would be yeah. like, you know, whatever the fact Right. They don't open it that much, though. I think they realize it's expensive to, to do yeah. it back and forth. Yeah. So it is, but it's still when you get a nice day. Right. Right. You, you right. can open it up. Yeah. Minneapolis is showing you can have an open air stadium. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. You don't want to wait all that snow. Question. <laughs> well, <laughs> last a couple of times. Yeah. 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 Totally agree. Even, even watching on TV, I'd watch a game on an outdoor stadium. If I had the choice, you know. Well, why are you thinking of? I went to school in, in California, and I've never been so cold in my whole life. Just <laughs> when I was in the, the nosebleed section of the Candlestick Park, and the in you know, sun goes behind yeah, cloud, it and <laughs> you yeah. just freeze yeah. to death. Right. Oh, it was a great ball. Good. This is good. Good presentation. Appreciate it. I'd any love any to more questions? You, All right. Yeah, if you're yeah, inclined yeah. To, to share that. With yeah. You. Yeah. Just setting up the winds. Updating okay, the winds. He's going to take the right. out. Set. So we can check. So we can see if anything. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Who changed the most? I guess who had a late season run. Do you have any questions on uh from uh on Zoom? Any James or Carlos? This is Robinson. 
No. No. Okay. Let's. Uh, uh, before I forget, I want to tell my story about Jerry Royce. He, uh, I interviewed him for the story, a uh, game story for the Astros book they did a while back, and he pitched a one hitter. I think he was like in his first or second year. So I'm getting all primed up, did all my homework, whatever. And so I actually, I traced, tracked him down, got him on the phone. He says, yeah, I'm glad to help him. I said, well, what do you remember about your one hitter with the Astros? He said, I don't remember a damn thing about it. <laughs> it was like, it's like almost the end of the interview, right? It's like, can you, can you tell me, okay, what was the food like that day or whatever? You know? But it was, it caught me off guard. He's like, I don't remember a damn thing about that game. And then I kept thinking, you know, he pitched in how many probably, Four five hundred games in his career, and he but you won, won two hundred games, and he probably didn't, you know. I, I think he actually threw a no hitter, didn't he? I believe uh, for the Dodgers. I think he may have. Uh, anyway, I got I got a Roy story. Okay, <laughs> my friend, he must be about seventy five, and maybe he was plus fifty or fifty five when he played in this league. Royce was in the league. And he signed autographs after the ball game. It was baseball. My friend played shortstop, so he was pretty good athlete. But Royce, his his lifelong dream was to play first base, and he never could because he was such a great pitcher. Yeah. So my friend thanked him afterwards. Thanks, Jerry, for, for not pitching. <laughs> but he said uh, he always wanted to play first, and that's what he he did in this. Uh, over 50 leagues. So he was like years ago, a lot of major leaguers would go down to the minor leagues. But I guess Jerry retired and and then um, found this over 50 league. Yeah. I think he's a photographer. He does like professional oh, really? photography. Yeah, if you, you can find out stuff on the on the internet. All right, this one uh here's a piece of thank you. So, I, you know, when uh, when doing research for some of the baseball articles and for saving whatever, I've run, a, I've read a lot of sporting news, and I found in 1960s there were a number of what I call innovations that were uh, brought up that makes you wonder to what what you know people were ahead of their time back in the day. And so I'll, I'll run through a few of these. Uh, the first one was uh, greed prevents a third major Mahatma in, in Mahatma insists. And this was when Branch Rickey promoted the idea of having a third major league called the Continental League. And uh, mm -hmm. I think right about that time is when uh, American National League expanded, which kind of killed killed his uh, killed his idea. But the uh, the other thing was that uh, the other major leagues didn't want to share the revenue, so right. that killed you know killed that idea. Um, uh, the next one was uh, uh, bust up the farm chain. Uh, Paul Richards predicted it in 1963 that there would be a demise of the minor leagues and that, um, you know, uh, because the teams were used primarily for development and didn't win champions, you know, weren't battling for championships that it would eventually just die out or they'd have something like the Arizona fall league type uh, uh, leagues available. Of course, now we, we went from 160 to 120 teams just a few years ago. And I suspect there may be more uh, contraction of that. You know, later on. So, um, and uh, the next one was uh, Benley proposed uh, a, uh, a, a nighttime World Series. Again, he, he's got money on his mind, right? He's looking at uh, larger TV audiences and revenues. And of, of course, the uh, what the World Series was first. And uh, let me see my notes. Pass a little back. Get that here. I think he. Uh, that would have been 60, uh, let's see, 63, 60, no, it was, um, first night, first night, well, first night game was, uh, 71, yeah, 71, yeah, yeah. That we are family Pittsburgh, What's that? No, yeah, this was the first night World Series game. It was a demise right here, game six and 87. I think this should be a day game. Somewhere in the world, soon. right? So uh, the next one was uh, running through these was the uh, Sporting News took a uh, to the fan poll to see whether they would like to have uh, interleague play, 
And of course, the fans uh, fans uh, warmed up to that pretty much. But it was not until 19, what, uh, 97 that the first interleague game was played. And of course, now we would do it. What would we do without them, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. every every team plays every other right. team now, and which is I think it's uh, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, next one was on a twenty uh, second clock uh, was in 1973 was being used by the Texas League. And again, they the intention was to speed up the game. Um, 1963, yeah. And uh, they had a you know the idea was that uh, the umpire was would call balls on slow hurlers, you know. Kind of like it reminds us of today, and they had uh, electronically controlled clocks that would uh, operate from the p press box to uh, do that. Of course, now that's that's become a actually a good part of the game with the pitch timer. Uh, uh, next one was uh, uh, electronic men in blue. Charlie James was a I think he played the maybe Yankees and Cardinals. I think back in the mid '60s, he was going to uh, school at a local college in uh, St. Louis, I think had an engineering class project and he developed a concept for a, for a uh, electronic uh, umpire. And uh, he estimated the cost was $50,000 at the time, which they thought, well, well, that would be too much money to spend huh, on such a thing. So of course now we're not too far away from getting the automated ball strike systems yeah. in the majors. I think I understand now they're, uh, they're taking everybody's profile. They're measuring, you know, uh, because uh, they want to make it individual to each oh, right. each player. So now, and it said what's revealing is a lot of players overestimated their height. Are now getting are now getting caught getting caught on that. <laughs> That's right. Huh? How many guys saw the Phillies and uh, the Diamondbacks the last game? Uh -huh. Last game. Yeah, the was almost perfect. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Play. Yeah. I didn't see many. Strikes not called. I mean, yeah. this guy was game six and seven. Those two yeah. umpires were really good. Well, the one I always look at is when, when the Astros play the Yankees, and you look at the same little phantom strike zone for Aaron Judge yeah. and Jose Altuve. Yeah, Altuve. It's the same size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah, on the broadcast. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a square. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the College World Series, you know, and LSU was making its push. Some umpires were all over the place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sitting up in college. They got to call you back. Yeah. Yeah, but these these Philly umpires with the Diamondbacks, they were the last two games almost perfect. Yeah. 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 The umpires are right 95 to 99% of the time. So, so, so he so yeah. I think he did like very, very minimal amount of games this year. I don't know. Right. He filed suit against MLB uh -huh. because they were going to suspend him or send him down. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, next one I had here was in, uh, I think it was in 63, Gene Malk, who was Philly's manager, asked for permission to have a batter bat for his pitcher during spring training games. Oh, really? So that he could stay in the game so they could keep him in the game a little bit longer and he could decide when when to take him out. And uh the uh thank God for the seventy yeah. two in the national exactly league. yeah right so, yeah, it does. Yeah. And then uh the final one here the final one here was uh Charlie Finley proposed using orange baseball so that he could batters could see them better. And he actually used them in uh, spring training in 1970. Of course, it never caught on in the majors, but uh, yeah, I don't think anyway. that. huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, that was I thought it was interesting that way back when they were thinking about these things, and some of them are now just now being yeah, yeah. just now being implemented. What you know, 60 years later, 50 or 60 years later. How they came up with the big base last year? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, the know, it, when they first said it. I thought it made all the sense in the world because I thought what they were doing was making a larger base at first so that you had the runner's lane and the, the you know, so you would protect the, the player. And that, I thought that made all the sense in the world and then the rest of the bases would be normal. But when they said, no, we're going to have second base is going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. The girls used to uh, yeah. wide at first base. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, they would, they would and and then the major you, know, you, you can't have, take a lead. Yeah, you can't when you used to have the belt that kept the pillows on the, you know, yeah. it, they were wired about that. Like now, it's on the on the pitch clock. Somebody told me, and I haven't looked it up, that the twenty second rule has always been yeah. since like nineteen twenty when they, they changed have, seventy five or eighty rules. They never enforced. They couldn't figure out how to enforce. Right. Well, the umpires were supposed yeah. to use their judgment, which they never, which they right. never right. did. Right. Judgment. Well, <laughs> which they do at first base is what they've done in softball. Have a bag on you know, the double bag. Yeah, but all territory, so the runner has no choice but to run straight to it. Yeah, but the but there's a thing with these hard bases. The guy, they say, when it's wet, it's wet. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he's digging, and he hits the top of that bag, he's liable to slide some. So why don't they go it's back right. to the old canvas bag? Yeah. Because that will twist your ankle more. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. someone in, in foul territory yeah. that eliminate the interference rule, yeah. the yeah. collisions. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's 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 interesting that instead of going with something like an orange baseball, they decided to take out the uh, center field bleachers instead, so that batters could see the ball better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would would have they would have made more money if they had uh, gone with Finley's idea instead. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably the Savannah. Bananas probably play with a oh, color yeah. ball, huh? Right? So, yeah. Oh, are they? Yeah, yeah they're coming from next week. I just okay. missed them up in Milwaukee. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I so, just no, no, for a pre-game series. Go back to the field. They're in 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 the field. Uh, Let's see. Uh, did you want to when you talk about the Continental League? There's a huge yeah. file about yeah. Young Thick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mayor Morrison was yeah. trying to negotiate yeah. a team in the Continental League really? when, yeah. when the Pelicans had sold their franchise. Right. He was trying to get a yeah. I had uh, I, I had access to uh, Lenny Yoakum's uh, notes. His, he kept his a, a scout and a they, he they consult. He got called in when they were trying to get the major league team here in New Orleans with the Superdome. He got called into a meeting with uh, was, who was the mayor then? The seventies would have been uh, uh, Landry. Land, Landry, yeah. He got called into a meeting with them, and uh, and he and he had kept the invitation letter, and he wrote on the back of it, "These guys, these son of bitches, don't know what the hell they do." <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, that that was, I think, all we had for a prepared uh, presentation. The other, the only other thing I have, a, I do have a item on the, uh, you know, we had elections last summer for the uh, Sabre uh, Club here, the local Shot Pelican Club. And uh, we, we complied with a number of other requirements at Sabre. National sat down about sort of governance, uh, governance uh, requirements for the Sabre chapters. And actually, we, we wound up doing pretty well. We I think we were one of five chapters that got uh, recognized as meeting all the, at least the basic basic requirements. Yeah, and uh, we just missed out on uh, one item that the, that the chapter of the uh, organizer for the chapters uh, nationally, we missed out on one item was uh, having bylaws for the club. So I took an opportunity to steal from some of the other chapters and drafted up a uh, uh, a draft set of uh, bylaws for the club. And so this is uh, um, I, I don't I don't want to go through them today. I think what I'd like to do is is just send these out. When we send out the meeting minutes, we can send these out, and you can provide some feedback on feedback on that. Uh, we do need to vote on them as a chapter. So we'll give a notice, 30 days notice and have a probably an online uh, voting uh, process to to adopt those. But, so this is one of the things at the end that there. Did you make any changes to this? No, I didn't. Uh, this okay, is what I'll do, I'm, I'm going to send out the, um, the next year's schedule. OK, uh, this afternoon. And I'll send that along with that. Chapter. OK, yeah, I'm thinking we can just put it in the meeting. You know, yeah. how we do compile the meeting yeah. notes. Yeah. 
And so uh, it's 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 pretty straightforward. It, it really just uh, provides some structure for the for the organization. And one of the intents of the Sabre National is to have continuity uh, within within a club from year to year, and then across some of the uh, some of the chapters. So um, the only other the only thing that I thought after I did this that we may want to consider is right now the Derby and I are the, the two officers. And the way it's written is we make up the board of directors. It probably makes sense to have a, a third, at least a third person who's on there to sort of be a tiebreaker in case we have issues that come up. So some, if we all agree with that, we can have an election for a for, for an at large uh, member that could then form the board. That that would be one thing I, I would probably suggest different from what's here. You have to send the draft to national before it's voted on. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I don't think so. I, I, I took it after uh, the Bob David's uh, group, I think it's out of is it Baltimore or yeah, Washington. I'll go, I'll go right there. Yeah. And so that was one uh, Peter Cottrell is the is the yeah. organizer for that group. So uh, I copied actually I copied a lot of it from there. Just uh, but it, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Um, so we'll we'll deal with that. Um, and uh, like I said, as, as a follow on activity. Uh, what else? Um, okay, anything else? Any other any other general discussion? Um, yep. not, okay. I just have um, the schedule for meetings for next year, so okay. everybody can mark their calendars. Yeah. Again, y'all, y'all on the on the on the on Zoom. will this will be sent out to you. So. Yeah, I'm going to send all this out this afternoon. I'll yeah. and I'll put the right. bylaws with it. Um, we're not meeting on the save up Saturday. They, they, they don't, they don't require you. They don't require you to right. do that. And it makes it, um, difficult for us to do that. We use their zoom right. account for, okay. for our meetings. So if we stick to our schedule on the, the fourth Saturday, we, we'll have a higher probability of being able to broadcast. And I think we get better representation from our out of town members by right. being able to do that. And, so, I, and I think um, they count yeah. anything in that two to three week period around what the National Saber Day they call that. Yeah, if you have they it, call that it, National it, Saber Day, right? You do it in January, right. January. Right. Yeah. So the only number you have to remember is twenty seven because it's the twenty seventh of January, April, and July, and then of course being a leap year, we got one one odd day off, and so that yeah, is in October. Yeah, right. um, but we we do ask everybody to you know. Um, We'll, we'll put you on the email distribution. If somebody doesn't want to be on that, they'll let us know. Um, so we'll contact you ahead of time uh, by email, RSVP, so we make sure that we know we have enough handouts for, for things. Or, you know, if, if people want to make a presentation, they got to get it to Richard so we can get it up. You know, a few little, little tidbits like that that we have to do. Um, and if, if you have, Someone that you'd like to, you know, and Richard's been doing yeoman duty by getting speakers for us, but um, I've been trying to work out a time to get the Tulane coach or maybe get Joe Sherman to come and yeah. just to talk to to the group. But, um, you know, just something new and different for us to, to do. And, of course, anybody who's interested in joining or, or coming, you know, I've tried to get Ron Swoboda half a dozen times. He says, I, I don't like statistics. Really? Now, this <laughs> coming from a guy who, when he does his, his he's got a sheaf of, yeah. of paper, so he can tell you, you know, what the guy's batting average is. You know, but um, I kept saying, you know, we don't talk about sabermetrics a whole lot, you know, but we'll, we'll try to have some some different types of speakers for that. We got this location of yeah, Dean yeah. With this, we'll, we'll keep this one yeah, uh, unless yeah. we. Yeah. Unless something comes up that they they boot us, but I, there, there's other rooms in here that we could possibly use if, in case this one is not. Well, she took when I came this morning. She said, oh yeah, y'all upstairs. Uh, yeah, that's what she tried to send me up. Right. Yeah. I've never been upstairs. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not a member. Can I? Oh yeah. Maybe shoot some suggestions. Sure. Absolutely. Speakers? Absolutely. Yeah. Like I told you, uh, non-members are always welcome. So we uh, we enjoy the discussion and the participation. No, so. I'll be it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make the last one because I was in Great Week. Yeah. And my brother had to vote that day. Hopefully, next time I can take it. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Good enough. Yeah. <laughs>
Priest of Friends. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a story. First game ever in Rivers. I'm 34. I was in 92, so I was four. My mom, my dad, and my two older brothers would live up there. Old style is the beer up there. Okay. And I went yeah. to my mom told me, you know, you go to the restaurant, the you go, it's bigger than that age. And I come out and I look up, and the guy up here drops an old style right in my face. He <laughs> 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 was just like, you were just like all over the place. And I select my first story about being a really good. You got, you got your first taste of the beer, right? Yeah. So, it was, it was yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then everyone can do it. That's cool. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? I mean, we we can we got more general discussion. Pick a topic, and we'll uh, talk some more about it. We don't have to necessarily convene at this point. Ms. Robinson or James, you have anything you want to uh, want to want to bring up? Uh, I have a. Um, I think I have an article coming out in twenty to eighty. The uh, the scouting. Um, committee's uh, uh, Sabres uh, uh, newsletter on my great uncle Lou McGuallow, um, who was uh, the chief Midwest scout for the Yankees, and before that, he was the head scout of the Browns. So I, I think that'll be coming out soon. Yeah. Right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, let us know when that. that okay. Comes out. Yeah. Perfect. There was some discussion last meeting, if I recall regarding um, high schools and trying to incorporate one of the public schools. Has anything yeah. done further with that? I tried this, Richard. I, I tried to, I reached out to Roe Brown to see if he could help me identify someone. And he said he would, but he never, he never was able to get back to me. So uh, well, we didn't, I'm going to, I'm going to get on his case then. Well, <laughs> he, he suggested that you tr you try to help us identify somebody since you went uh, went to school there, right? Uh, McDonald thirty five. Yeah, he was not a he was not a uh, he. He said, you know, I'm not a graduate of that school. And I said, well, I don't know. I said, figured you you know you're a prominent guy here in New Orleans. You would know. Uh, and he's he he did know um, he did know one of the former teachers. He was going to try to call her, but. I said he must not have gotten in touch with her. So I, we didn't. I'll, I'll get in touch with him. <laughs> yeah. If you, or, if you, or if you can point me to someone else, you know, maybe what we could do is start with the new semester in, uh, in January. You know, we could pick that up. So we do have the one going on with Jesuit again. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's light attendance. We're trying to stir them up a little bit more. Uh, but we do have a few uh, very interested uh, students that are, they're, they're, they know a lot about baseball, right, Rick? I mean, they're, they're pretty conversant. Yeah, yeah, no, with um, yeah, they're, they're good group. So, um, what else? Um, anybody have anything else? That we, um, yeah, I mean, I have some more ideas like this. I'll update this one, and then, um, yeah, I'm still affiliated with like my my grad school, so maybe we can sponsor some projects. Okay, with the Saber name on it. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, going into spring. Maybe now you this year with the finders. Um, well, well, I was watching the uh, Saber Analytics Conference virtually, and um, they were talking a lot about injuries and stuff. So good to um, yeah. And the pitch clock. <laughs> yeah. So you, oh, you, right, you, right, right. Yeah. So do you, you're gonna try to update, right? Right. Can you send that to either me or Derby? Because I'd like to include that in our communications packet that we send yeah. out. We'll right. include the electronic copy. We'll get an electronic copy and send that out to everybody. So, yeah, yeah, okay. it's better with the team there. So. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe put your identifier, your name on it as a source. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. I'm because sorry. it'll that that work. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess that, if no one else has anything else, uh, well, you got talk about your. Dixie series book. Oh. I think that's come out since we last met, right? Uh, yeah, but I've had two come out. Since yeah, right. I think Derby fell off Mac with the Dixie series. Book. Yeah. The yeah. Dixie series was the third oldest post series competition in professional baseball yeah. after the World Series and the Little World Series. And it was a champion of the Texas League and the champion of the Southern Association. Um, 
Now, the, the idea, of, it wasn't the pennant win because you had a playoff. You could win the pennant, and then they took the top four teams, and you had a Shaughnessy playoff. Correct. So the number four team could actually win the championship yeah. if he won the, the, the playoff. Right. And that happened on more than one occasion. Um, but it was first proposed in 1920, and it was uh, not sanctioned by either league. But uh, when they saw how many people showed up in the gate receipts and the revenue that could be <laughs> realized by such a series, they quickly jumped on board and both leagues got behind it. And there were some wonderful characters who, who made their name in the in the Dixie series. Uh, Dizzy Dean being one mm -hmm. who, uh, who uh, you know, when he, his famous thing, it, it ain't bragging if you could do it. Well, he was he was bragging the whole time, and Ray Caldwell from Ray Birmingham Caldwell. shut him out. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, was Dizzy with Houston? Houston Buffalo. Yeah. But. Um, there was a group, um, you were talking about old, I'm going to take a couple of steps, old Pelican Park, not mm -hmm. Pelican Stadium. Pelican Park was across from Jesuit High School. Right, yeah. And there's a, a prominent local architect, Robbie Cangelosi, who, who works for the Cabildo and does a lot of historic renovation. He called me one day and said, found a, a belt buckle when I was digging in my garden, it was from the White Sox. Oh, really? Oh. And I said, oh, yeah, well, I know whose that is. Goes, no, you know what it is? I said, yeah, I know what it is, but I know whose it is, too. <laughs> goes, how do you know whose it is? He said, well, it probably belonged to Jake Atz. Jake Atz had been a Pelican player, had gone up to the White Sox, and he came in every year to spring training with the Pelicans, and he was an umpire. So there's a very famous picture of Shoeless Joe Jackson's yeah. first game. Uh -huh. The black figure in the background is Jay Gatt. Oh, really? The umpire. Uh, he lost his silver belt buckle from the White Sox. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, great. Jay Gatt was was the manager of the Fort Wall, the Fort Worth Cats. They used to be the Panthers, um, and then they went to the Cats later. Um, he had a pitching dynasty, and they won six out of the first seven Dixie series. Really? And their boss pitcher was a guy named Joe Pate, graduate of Tulane University, yeah. uh, never made it in the pros, but he was lights out in the Texas League. That's awesome. Y'all yeah. uh, ever heard of Ebbets Field Flannels? Yeah. Yeah. Jerry yeah. Combs is a good friend. Of uh, awesome. Yeah. I just remember when that started coming about, you could decide. Now they've expanded so much for okay. like college now. And um, well, we're, we're, we're baseball talking here, but maybe football and all stuff talk. But when you say all these team names, when I was searching a lot of these minor leagues, they originally started about that, as you know. And you know, a lot of these old, and even a lot of the Negro League teams, too, it's just like all these jerseys they have on there. It's just like, you know. Jerry is a great guy, and I, I, I kid him all the time. I said, you know, the only reason he kept, his company was kind of floundering, just not going anywhere, until the gangs got a hold of his, his Negro League jerseys yeah. and colors. Mm -hmm. And the gangs... Promoted. promoted the hell out of oh, it. Really? And he made a lot of money with it. Luckily, he did a lot more, you know, international work and stuff like that. And he's just such a really good guy. Yeah, we got the Japanese, even the Japanese ones. And they do, they do wonderful stuff. I think he's trying to sell the company now. He's getting well, money. I just put on what it's on search because you're all talking. I was looking because you mentioned some of the teams and I was, because I don't know if the actual store is open. You could go online. Correct. I, mean, I used to remember, was in Brooklyn or where was the original located? Yeah. yeah. Cause I was like, man, I always wanted, they had the Golden Falcons, you know, the black and white ones, right? The Pit Fires, and then with the Cardinals, uh, what people want had as well. Um, I actually have a Pelicans one of the baby cakes for making out one time. No. I got the gift. Yeah. That was not a real team. No, it was an all time. Like that was like wake up from the three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so but I remember seeing all that site. I was like, this is just. Phenomenal, but I was like a little pricey. Well, you know, he did, he did a replica series, a jersey and hat for the 1915 Pelicans. Yeah, yeah. And he said it has this unusual symbol on it. And I said, Jerry, you got to be the worst Jew in the world not to know what the symbol is. It had a star of David. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, was on the thing. I said, What kind of Jew are you? you know? <laughs> he says, Well, I wasn't going to say anything, you know. So, 
But if you if you look at it, it says the ownership of the team was Jewish. Heinemann was Jewish. Um, I've got the stockholders list from 1905 every year all the way up to the 20s. Um, Isidore Newman was a shareholder. His sons were share. Tharp and Sontheim and the, the funeral home people were. And, and they're all members of the Jewish, prominent members of the Jewish community. So they, you know, they were, and then the oyster fishermen. It was like this <laughs> night and day. It was like all the oyster fishermen and grocers and all the, the merchants and stuff. So. And that's what I like the most because, like, I think I'm talking with my time. I don't mention that I have, I, I love patches, like the whole, like, the, you know, the namely of patches, like from, I have a book that I've, I've well, it's a big, you know, page book that I bought from. I was trying to get it to come. Is a uh, Yankee fan. I bought it from him for like 300 bucks. And it's got, I should know, you know, that patent book I had, it's got all the ones from back then, you know, like the original Cubs ones, you can name all the Phillies, Yankees. And then when they had the World Series, they did patches for the war as well. They held the patches. Centennial, yeah. And they all in a book and patched up. And then I got into a patch collection from a Cubs fan where I was getting every patch possible. And I like all buying all my jerseys when they're stitched and they got the ones on the left. Yeah. The left. That's cool. And one of my best friends, the Sox fan, first started in the bottom of Ted Williams, 39, with the Centennial patch on it. So, it's, yeah, I just, I, I find that to be, that's one thing about baseball, it's just like the knowledge of the patches, and they've expanded so much over the years. That's the thing about you can find one. I have a pilot's one there, too. From the brick. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah. one thing that helps you when, you when you see an old photograph and you don't know, a lot of people don't take the time to attribute who the photographer was or the year. You do it, yeah. How do you identify them? And the patches in the insignia are one way to be able to do that. I have a Browns patch as well. Yeah, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that one right there. Yeah. Tell them uh, the story behind hats. Well, his his real name was Jacob Zimmerman. Okay. And uh, like a lot of these guys, he was you know playing um, semi pro ball and, and whatnot. And these leagues would fold pretty quick. Yeah. So he was playing with one organization. They they went toes up and they still told everybody line up alphabetically. And the treasurer had a cigar box and he had cash and he was going to pay everybody. Well, by the time he got to Zimmerman, he ran out of cash. <laughs> so he said that'll never happen again. He changed his name to Atz, which was A to Z. <laughs> and uh, That's a great story. he was he was a well, you know he he when Heineman committed suicide, they moved Larry Gilbert into the front office for one season. Yeah. And Jake Atz came over to manage the Pelicans oh. in 32. And it was a disaster. They, they couldn't win a thing. And, you know, and uh, he went he went back and became an umpire. And, um, Gilbert went back and won two Dixie series, Dixie series 30, yeah. 32 and 33. So uh, but the Dixie series was a, was a wonderful competition. And uh, they, they tried to resurrect it, but you know, any connection to like the Dixie U around here? No, yeah, it, I was it, curious. Of course, if you if you Google it, this is the the hard part about using the internet and not knowing how to search. If you just Google Dixie series, the first thing that comes up is the is most common. Okay, okay. But you know, if you if you have a, a my most recent book is on steamboats, and so they, if you, you do a, a, a steamboat was named the Princess. Well, if you Google princess, you're going to get every royalty, every you know, every name. Of, so it's it's uh, frustrating <laughs> from time to time. Yeah, but knowing how to search and getting it done, you can, you can get through all that. So you mentioned patches. What do you guys think of the new ad advertising? I hate them. I don't. Oh, the thing to me is like it's even like you can go into like but they were subtle, you know, little things. Yeah. But they're so big and ugly. I just want him to get it over with. Put him in a NASCAR jumpsuit. <laughs> and get it over with. You know, NBA, it's, NBA it's, too. Yeah, they yeah. Look, they've always had advertising in the you know billboards in the outfield. You've right. always had that. Um, you've always had it around the scoreboards and stuff like that. But now it's you know the the green screen behind the batter's box so that they can change. They can change it. Change it. Change it they yeah. they use the same technology that you use to for the first down marker in football, the invisible line. You're putting the logo on the pitcher's mound on the side of the pitcher's mound. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And because the games are shorter, the leagues have found a way to keep the same ad revenue. Now you don't get to hear the broadcaster during a pitching change. They do a split screen and they have a 15 second commercial. Mm -hmm. So they can sell the same amount of advertising time in a two and a half hour game as they did in a three and a half hour game. And it aggravates the heck on you. I don't mind the ads, yeah. or, but I want to hear the broadcaster. Yeah. You bring I happen game. to like listening to the game. game. And that's fun. You know, I mean, I'm being a Buzz fan. I love day games. I love yeah, like, look, he's like, you'd be a thing. Sometimes what's going on. It's great to listen to it. I don't know. If I'm at home, I'll just go on my phone. It'll be good. Yeah, I love how the Cubs, like, they're the only team that regularly does Friday afternoon. They do Friday yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like come on, there's got to be at least another team or two who can yeah. like, start the weekend off a little early. You bring up, you bring up the ads <laughs> and in the back of the day and all the time. Right. <laughs> I was telling Rick one time, I watch uh, YouTube a lot, and I pull up how they had on MLB Network back in the day. They lost ballparks. Cause that's another thing. Patches and old school ballparks, like, I love that. And they interviewed a bunch of people on the question of the Evans, Sportsman Far, Crosley. Um, but they brought up Evans, and I, he's a uh, he's worth like CNN as like an uh, anchor back in the day. I can't remember his name, but he's a big Brooklyn Dodgers fan. They talked about, you know, probably now, and I can't think of the uh, the local store in Brooklyn at the time. But if you hit a line drive on a shot, you hit it, you get a free suit. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, I just can't think of the name of the suit. And it's like, he, yeah, he said he's been watching games for years. And he's like, nobody's ever going to hit a line drive to get a free suit. So, <laughs> well, they used to, yeah. a lot of in Pelican Stadium yeah. on Tulane, there used to be a place called the Home Plate Inn. Yeah. Matt yeah. Lerman's yeah. Yeah. place. Home Plate Inn. And, yeah. and you see, if, if, you, sure have, if yeah. you hit one out there, you got a free dinner at, at Home Plate Inn. Yeah. yeah. A lot of the pictures out of, as a matter of fact, a lot of the pictures from the, the 30s in the book came from Home Played In. He used to have a, his all-star team on a on a big board, you know, uh, with a ballpark, it had his favorite player at each position. Um, and and when they closed down, he gave them all the art shot. And oh, right, okay. they made copies of it. So, mm -hmm. cool thing. So how's your guys' addition? How's your mathematics? How's your mathematics? Mine? Yeah, anybody's. So anybody's ever seen this. So you guys don't know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to strip. Right? <laughs> yeah. I am. I ain't getting paid for yeah. it. <laughs> Did it? Just one three. Yeah. 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 Double plus. It's a close share right there. Yeah. yeah. Good to know. Good to know. I thought you were going to go, like, oh, okay, how many faders? <laughs> like 10. You know, it's 10. So how do you count, right? One, two, three, four, five, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five and six is 11. <laughs> you know? Well, one of the things I was talking about, about new books on steamboats. And what got me interested in it was. The first captain of the Pelicans was a guy named Abner Powell, oh, yeah. who wound up owning the team in the Southern Association when they redid it in 1901. And one of the things that he talked about is how he developed a tarp to cover the infield. He, he, he always, and I've read every interview that he ever gave, he was waiting at the, the riverfront to pick up a player from a steamboat from oh, wow. St. Louis. And he noticed the stevedores were covering all the cotton bales with cotton with the canvas tarp. He said, because if it rained, the, the cotton bales would soak up all the water and be heavier. These little cotton bales weighed 500 pounds a piece. Okay. So when you see an illustration of a, a guy carrying one on his back, never happened, right? Three or four of them at a time to, to do it. I said, he, he, he covered it with this wax canvas tarp. And we have a fellow who comes into our meeting, Gene Gomes, yeah, all the time who comes in. He, it was his great grandfather. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. And so he and I tracked it down. And I've, I've almost got it to where I know which player he was picking <laughs> up. Really? Which yeah. team. Pretty cool. yeah. I hadn't got it yet. The other story about Abner where they said, well, he didn't like the way the team was playing. 
So he took the train to, to Carolina and bought a new team and brought it back. <laughs> Fired the old team and put in the new team. Wow. That was one of those things never happened. They have every transaction yeah. that he made, every right. date right. that he made it. And he replaced the team, but he did it systematically. He didn't right. win. But it was one of those wonderful stories, you know, the press picked up on and made Abner a character. And he, Abner, was a character. Right. Mm -hmm. So who would y'all like to see the Astros get as manager? Weston. Anybody I guess. Weston? Weston if, Baker. I don't like Weston Baker. Yeah, he, he, uh, he, he's packing it in. So Yeah, well, you know. I don't blame him, but he did. He did step into a hornet's nest. I get, yeah. I'll give him that. You know, that was yeah, not a. Do you think, do you think he's a hall of famer? Hall of Famer as a manager? Oh yeah, oh yeah. He's got to wait his five. Yeah. Be What's that? Be I don't know. Uh, I don't know. He could. Be, he could be. Uh, yeah, it was Milwaukee. Milwaukee uh, because now counts his contract. Going. Yeah. Did he ever run? Oh, he was talking, yeah, talking about the net. Talking well, about the net. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's a hometown boy, but they just can't keep the Astros or Mets. What about Showalter? around. <laughs> I don't think he wants to come anywhere out the Northeast. Yeah, because he was offered a chance to go. Uh, well, they're talking about if Council goes there, he's going somewhere else. He yeah. might not be in baseball. Yeah. Yeah. They better, they better keep him. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what the. Frankenstein, Brennan, do. Mm. Uh, I, I, I happen to like Brian Cashman. I think he's a good Jew. Yeah. Yeah, but you got to look at the results. I mean, it's, what's what the last you, time? What have you done for me? That's yesterday? right. What's what? Yeah, 2009? Is that the yeah, last time they? It's a long time. Sure. Uh, Aaron Judge would have signed somewhere else. Yeah, a bit of excitement yeah. just to see him on a different team. And then like Hawker. Yeah, 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 yeah. I grew up after he switched from the Nats to the Phillies. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, they're talking about trying the Yankees trying to get Juan Soto. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Look, I'm probably the only Yankee fan in the world that's, that's in long. favor of revenue sharing. But <laughs> <laughs> you had some James. Uh, uh, I, I would, <laughs> I, I, not, actually not, but I, I did know I, um, that demolition derby night is having a moment in popular culture. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, a big part of the Netflix documentary on Mike Veck, which is pretty good if you haven't seen it. And now there's a new uh, album of baseball songs by the the Baseball Project, which is made up of musicians from REM. And one of their songs is um, uh, Disco Demolition. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? I mean, we, we can we can hang around, or if you've got somewhere to go, feel free to go. Yeah, I'm picking on this thing, man. Yeah. I don't remember your name. My name is Dan. 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 My Dan. girlfriend's my grandfather. I was yeah. raised in yeah. Yeah. I was raised in Detroit. Yeah. What was your first? Yeah. My dad traveled from Detroit to Chicago to Milwaukee, and I used to be at. Well, it was Brick Stadium now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, my cousin had the bus to go there. What was your first We go there and you get outside and you could sell the pills for a quarter for people to buy them to sit on. Uh -huh. yeah. And the kids, we would go take a bus and we'd, we'd get in free right. by going to, you know, to Hand out sell the pills. pills. So, we, you know, so we get to see the ball game for free. But it only costs a buck to go in the bleachers anyhow if you want to buy a ticket. That's so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That means you could save for both games, both double headers. Get there in the morning, you're there until dark. Right. Yeah. You remember your first, you remember your first game? game against Cleveland. We sat through both those headers. The last one was like 18 minutes. And Rock and Calabito hit a whole run in like 18 minutes. We were walking out the stadium. We heard everybody that was left. I'm sure we were right back up. See Calabito touching home. We just come home from. We'll take her all day. We what was the first game you went to? Do you remember? That'd be the first game at Briggs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We had a local fellow used to yeah, broadcast. Oh, really? No, no, I used to be a broadcaster. Ted Williams, Bobby Dillon, Ted Williams, John DiMaggio. My, uh, my thing. older brothers, and so and my dad, when we lived in Chicago, uh, they would go to 
some of the day games and they would back in the day they would pay they would give the kids a free ticket to the next game if you knocked all the leash seats up. Oh okay. So like, okay, that knock second. <laughs> yeah. Other than all, you come to the to the game for the next one against the Cubs one went sixty games, fifty five games. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Get all the seats up and go to the games. Great. <laughs> well, I met Mr. Vex's son in, in Chicago at the conference. Oh, really? This, this year? Yeah. yeah, he's yeah. he's quite a character. Yeah. He had the world's largest pillow fight. <laughs> Did you know that? No. Yeah. Yeah, this was at St. Paul. He said, yeah. close enough to uh, the twins, but he was around, you know, the Miss, uh, Mississippi River, a little bit downstream of St. Paul on the other side. And he kept the Saints' uh, attendance up with then people put on these uh, raincoats, you know, what they sell for five bucks. Covers your head and stuff. Poncho. Clear plastic. Yeah, poncho. Poncho. Yeah. Poncho. Yeah. Poncho. yeah. Well, you had the world's largest food fight. Well, <laughs> the people had to clean it up after, after, I don't know how you clean all this. Right. Grease or whatever, <laughs> red beans or whatever. Oh, you know, uh, the guy is, and I think he's up. He's got to get up there now. Gotta he's got to be on the good side of fifty-five. I yeah. would say. I would think so. Yeah. Maybe he's. Oh, young shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Just like his dad. Uh, I talked to him after he spoke. You know. And, I gave him my phone number when he comes to town. Maybe I should call you guys. Sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a treat, yeah. Well, you know, he had the record lowest attendance mm -hmm. where he locked everybody out of the ballpark and set up bleachers in the parking lot and had concessions and everything. And then after his official game, he let everybody into the game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the stuff they came up with. Yeah. Mike Beck. Okay, something about him. This father, they had a book written on his back as in wreck. Okay. Yeah. You ought to read. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you just talking about Bill. Well, you know, we're talking about Bill Beck. Looking at the yeah. Yeah. Shortest, yeah. shortest professional baseball player yeah. on record. Yeah. Eddie Goodell. Yeah. And he had the one arm guy, right? Yeah. Who was the one arm guy? Pete Gray. Pete Gray. Pete Gray. Yeah, the one arm player. It's Pete Gray. Yeah. yeah. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> He set up showers at left field because we lived in Chicago when I was a kid. He'd take a shower at left field uh -huh. park. They had showers. You go pull the floor, <laughs> get that the water was hot. Yeah. They had bleachers. They used to have a screen on the bottom at the vestry park, and they had bleachers underneath the screen, and they had picnic tables, and you could bring your food and eat. Oh, cool. I had a picnic table and looked through the screen out of the ball field. Oh. But if you got hot, you go to left field, they had a shower. You pull the rope and water was yeah. on. <laughs> Feel that. Yeah. Yeah, he had a little bitch about that high up there. <laughs> but somebody said they told him, he said, of course, he signed that one day contract. One day, yeah. They said, now there's a guy in the in the bleachers with a rifle. You swing that down, yeah. he's going to shoot yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, that's the way. <laughs> but then, Hack Wilson would be the second shortest player. Yeah, that's learned how I like Hack. Oh, you know, of course, Eddie Goodell, I don't know if he counts. It's Official player, but they were they were, we were talking to Mel Ott. Somebody said, "Well, the, the Pelicans wouldn't sign him because he was too small." No, the guy they signed was Lou Ripper, who was the pitcher, oh, right. okay. who, who was the same size. Yeah, it, he was just a year older, and it was too much paperwork because <laughs> he was only sixteen. Right. Yeah. So you know, you look at think his career couldn't happen today. Where he goes to goes to New York, <laughs> McGraw hires him as a sixteen year old. Yeah, right. Keeps him for two years as a pinch hitter. Right. Okay. It would never happen to them. Oh, you were talking about baseball cards uh, again. One of the Lenny Yokums in his files, he had uh, he had signed a contract with Bowman, having his baseball card. Yeah. And I think it was sixty bucks. That's <laughs> what they were going to give him. Well, they never, they never sent him the sixty bucks. So <laughs> he has all kind of correspondence saying, "You guys never sent me, sent me." Well, I don't think he ever had a major league baseball card no. that I know of. But um, <laughs> well, he, well, he told me he, uh, he had it out with Mister Ricky. He went to, told Ricky, he said, 
Mr. Ricky, when, when you signed me, I, you promised a thousand dollars bonus. So I'd like my thousand dollars. And he said, Yoakum, you scheduled a pitch. I suggest you put that pirate uniform on. <laughs> I'm going to send you back to the morning. Yeah, that's a true story. He that was in his uh in his files. He had an account of that. Yeah. Yeah, he had a nephew who played Hal Bevin. That was a uh, cousin, I think. Wasn't cousin. It? Yeah, Hal Bevin. So related to he's the only guy who has two different rookie cards. Oh, really? For that's two a, different years. Uh, Bevin was uh, George Strickland. It, Related to George Strickland, okay. I think. Yeah. I know, so one of them, yeah. but he's got two different rookie parts from two different years for the Cincinnati Reds. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Al, thank you. Yeah. Al Bevan had a son when I was at UNO learning to play pool, you know. I'd only go in the pool home on a Friday just for a little bit. I watched these guys play. This guy, Al Bevan, was terrific. I don't know what I think he might have gone to deal with Sal. He was just yeah. an outstanding pool player. <laughs> and then there was a guy, Bone. I guess people on Bone Ford. Oh, really? He was another one. Then they had a black guy. Man, was he good. Crowds would gather with any of these three players. <laughs> All right. All right ready, ready to go on, man. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, good. yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. Good, Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Friends, Look forward. Exactly. Yeah. I will. Yeah. I had spots there for that. I'm trying to get it covered. Yeah. After that. Yeah. Okay, James. We're going to sign off here. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for attending. I apologize for the rocky start. Uh, it's my no my my ignorance with Zoom. So. Yeah. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Bye.